Welcome to the Future of Eastern Europe and Eco-Democracy, a four-part podcast special produced by the Green European Foundation with the support of the Green Institute of Greece and the financial support of the European Parliament to the Green European Foundation. The podcast features extracts from interviews of delegates to the Future of Eastern Europe conference, which took place on the 6th and 7th of June in Riga. The conference brought together young green activists from different parts of Eastern Europe to talk about the future of the region, as well as the challenges and opportunities for an ecological and progressive turnaround. In this episode, we hear from Sandy Familiari from Electra Energy Cooperative and Greenpeace Greece, Theo Comet from the European Green Party and the Green European Foundation, Alexei Kudritsky from the Belarusian Greens, and Georgi Pskelaje from CDN Corporation and Development Network Eastern Europe. The episode focuses on energy and energy democracy, our reliance on fossil fuels and its geopolitical ramifications, and the possibilities for a sustainable, just, and democratic transition. Do you think that more energy democracy will automatically lead to faster decarbonization and improve social well-being? For sure, yeah. If uh, citizens get access to energy democracy, which means renewable uh, sources of energy, then for sure it will be fastened. We've seen examples already happening. In Greece, for example, energy communities helped to develop more and more solar infrastructure, for starters, and we will see many more in the future, which means that we have automatically some citizens cut off from fossil fuels, and it's a very practical method to go forward. Are there any good examples of energy democracy in your country, from your experience? We've seen many collective schemes working on energy, which are very good. We have more than 1,000 energy communities registered at the moment. Of course, I don't know one by one what they're doing, but we have some examples that are pretty impressive. We have energy communities uh, solely from women, with uh, women members. We have others who give away free shares to vulnerable households. And we've seen solidarity taking place. We've seen uh, projects that actually respect the environment and the local communities. The other day I was talking to to a person from an energy community in Agrinio, and they told me that they were planning to install a wind turbine and the local society didn't want it. So they changed plans and they actually did a solar park, which is awesome. They take the um, people's thoughts into account and it's uh, it's really nice to see them collaborating and actually adapting to the circumstances which is not the issue with uh, big companies usually. They do not care about a society or a community and they just want to take the profit away from the people actually. In the light of the current events in Eastern Europe, what do you think is the role of energy democracy? Very interesting question. I think that the ongoing war in Ukraine uh, has shown us the importance of the combination of state efforts and also citizen organizing. This is something that does not come from anywhere. We have already seen it during uh, COVID, how important the intervention of uh, states was, particularly in in the EU, but also globally, in um, strengthening the economic resilience of uh, society in times of a crisis, but also the tremendous citizen efforts that were undertaken to fight against the pandemic. And now with the war in Ukraine, we see that war is perhaps the the clearest state effort but also we see a lot of autonomous organizing we see we see it in the field of uh, self defense against uh, the russian aggression we also see it in uh, different types of uh, humanitarian efforts in ukraine but also outside of ukraine for example in uh, how several uh, societies in europe perhaps in particular poland have organized uh, around citizens to host uh, the refugees coming from fleeing ukraine and uh, I think that this definitely relates to energy questions. The movement to liberate Europe from dependency on fossil fuels from Russia is uh, led by both institutions and social movements. 
institutions in terms of uh, several governments pushing for faster action. Of course, there are several challenges on government level in different EU countries, but we also see that the, the changes, there are concrete changes that are happening and it was not self-evident that they would have happened after the aggression that started on, on 24th of February. But we also see a lot of citizens taking concrete measures to liberate us from these fossil fuels. We see that Extinction Rebellion, for example, is non-violently blocking imports of Russian fossil fuels in different countries. And this combination of institutions and autonomous organizing is a key feature of uh, the energy transition. During the last session, you mentioned a really interesting quote you heard at the conference the other day. Could you please tell us more about the quote and your perception on it? Yeah, one of the officials of the European Green Party on the conference said that uh, it was better that we will bought fossils from 10 bad guys than instead of one bad guy. And I understand why she told that, but I think that it's a wrong position because we don't need to support bad guys at all. Because uh, in Belarus in 2020, uh, protests uh, was uh, attacked by police, by Czech uh, flashing grenades and uh, European uh, shockers and so on and so forth. So they got it when Lukashenko was one of 10 bad guys, but not one bad guy. And uh, when it needed it, uh, use it to start an aggression war or aggressive war or uh, start a war with uh, his own people. And what can Europe do? Which steps can uh, Europe implement in order to ensure a just and smooth transition from the 10 bad guys to one bad guy to no bad guys at all? Are there any like things we can do to secure that? Yes, we should uh, do with bad guys only on uh, our special demands, not uh, buy oil, just buy oil, just do economic trade, but buy oil or fossils and so on and so forth uh, with uh, political demands and economical demands and social demands. You not just do economic things with the dictators who want this economic collaboration. Thank you very much. Do you think that more energy democracy automatically lead to faster decarbonization and improves the social well-being? Energy, as during the session we it was mentioned, and I very much agree on that, the energy we consume really defines the lives we are living in with many uh, aspects of it, you know? And so if we are using coal as an energy source, you know, for the electricity or for heating or whatever, then we are living in a very bad life. We have miners who are working in a very bad conditions, and then we have polluted air, and we have uh, problems with the health, and we have a lot of, lot, lot of, lot of, lot of problems. But, and at the same time, I mean, we are, the biggest problem is also this energy dependence that you, and somehow European countries, even after this red flag on which we have been talking about, managed to become dependent on the Russian gas and oil. And they managed to do that, which they could have very easily avoided. So on the one hand, we have these bad life conditions due to, due to energy we are using. And on the other hand, we have this energy dependence on a foreign country, which is not just a foreign country, it's an authoritarian country that has a very imperial ambitions and that is using energy as a political tool. And we have seen that very clearly in the last month, but also last decades, you know, it just cut down gas to Georgia in 2006 and people, the several people have died because of that. It cut down uh, gas to, to other European nations sometimes and you just should not have done that. Um, so you have the energy dependence and you have this bad life quality if you are dependent on uh, fossils. Energy is perhaps the single most important issue on everyone's minds. Rising costs, potential shortages, and even power cuts, as well as the prospect of millions of households being left to endure a very hard winter, paint a very bleak picture. The issue poses major existential challenges for many countries, with repercussions on the economy, security, trade, and foreign relations. Although we have seen steps towards a renewable energy transition, and these have accelerated, 
it's also important to note how this transition is being implemented in social and environmental terms. Are we moving towards a more decentralized, sustainable system where citizens play an active role and where energy is considered a common good? Or is this just another opportunity for corporate power grabbing and greenwashing? How can we avoid being at the mercy of authoritarian governments that use energy as a tool for geopolitical ends? Can we ultimately divest as quickly as possible from fossil fuels and fossil fuel extraction? What measures should be put in place so that this energy transition is truly green? Do you think we're all equal uh, against the energy crisis? Everyone is affected from the energy crisis, but of course the most vulnerable ones are the ones that are affected more. Like if you're already in uh, an energy poor family, then of course it's uh, more difficult for you. If you have like tons of money and you're a big, uh, big investor, then you get hit, but the, the, um, the effect is not that massive on you. The sad part is that this crisis is uh, going on for so long and there, we haven't seen any solutions to that. The consumers actually are the ones that are paying for it through their bills, through the subsidies that the uh, government is giving away, through the products actually, because the energy prices rising means that every product gets even uh, more expensive as well. So it's a domino effect, kind of. If we switch to collective schemes and an energy community system, then we will see these, uh, these situations fading away, in a way, something like that. <laughs> what steps should the EU, according to your opinion, implement in order to ensure just energy transition after the embargo of fossil fossil fuels? One important step that needs to be undertaken is that we need to recognize our structural problems in particular, the role of the fossil lobby in policymaking on, uh, on ecological questions on national level, on EU level, in the realm of uh, UN climate negotiations. We need to talk about how problematic it is that uh, policymakers in Europe have had, some still have, their hands in the pockets of the fossil companies that are not advocating for policies in the common good, but clearly in, the, in favor of the profits of their shareholders, and then take the consequences of that. How do we isolate such vested interests from decision-making for the common interest? Secondly, I think that it's crucial that the EU, but also any other public uh, institutions, empower citizens, municipalities, different types of public institutions, businesses, trade unions, um, basically everyone who has an urge to do something when they see that there is a crisis, to have the means and the knowledge to be a part of the transition, the social and ecological transition, to know what to do and, uh, and to make it very easy for people to find other people to do it together with. Because this is not a transition that will be only led from the top. Quite the contrary, it's a transition that in order for it to succeed, big parts of our societies uh, need to be a, an active part of it. It's clear that one size doesn't fit all. It's, it's complicated to list concrete measures for what could work and what we should avoid. And I think that it starts with uh, an honest uh, power analysis of the status quo and then uh, different steps that have as an aim to empower people. And we should also recognize that we, for example, in green parties, we also don't know right now, for example, what are the, the actions we, we, we as green parties or as citizens should should be undertaking in the near future, what is what citizens want to do. There's a lot of uh, very important uh, conversations to, to have around this question and um, it's a commitment from the European Greens to make sure that we create those spaces where citizens can join these conversations and that we can create this transition together. I do think that the energy transition is, is going to be the key also for democratization, because, well, we have this, this very famous oil curse, right? And if you check the just list of the countries who are, that are in rich oil countries, you know, rich oil and gas countries, I mean, most of them are very autocratic, most of them are very authoritarian, most of them are very unequal, like, I don't know, Russia, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, you have, I mean, a lot of Azerbaijan in Europe. This is also a big thing, I mean, and it's very centralized, so, and it's very, very much around the power. The energy transition 
can really contribute to the democratization itself. But at the same time, it, it will be also important to not just replace uh, gas and oil with wind farms, which are going to be under the same system, but to have this more democratic way of deciding on the energy. You know, we talked about the energy cooperatives, we talked about local communities that can, that can own the energy. You know, it's not a centralized system where one ministry is managing all the power, but there is the local communities that have their own power. One wind farm to every village and the big wind farm near the city, so it, it's much more decentralized. But of course, it needs infrastructure, it needs political wind, it, need, it needs money. And in this transition period, as you said, the social aspect should not be left out because, I mean, we have seen that when wannabe greens, let's say like that, do green stuff in quote marks, they don't do that well. Uh, Macron policy of uh, rising oil prices in France ended up with Gilets Jaunes because it was completely ignoring the social aspect of this energy transition. So we, as the Greens, are not only talking about the energy transition per se, but we are talking about the just transition because it's the whole process. We have to while we are switching from dirty energy, we have to also switch from this dirty politics and this dirty way of living on this planet. So while we are transitioning, we should, we should make sure that we don't leave anyone behind because of, well, our values as well, because we, live, we believe in a just society, we believe in social equality, we believe on all this social justice, but at the same time, we also pragmatically, because they're going to have a backlash. If uh, because of your policies, which are raising prices on fuels and people are still dependent on fuels and then you don't don't intervene as a state and you leave everything for the markets. Well, market aim is to prove profit, you know, and the market will never really be very social un unless you have a s social state which would guarantee that markets is also not just profiting, but also benefiting the society as such. So it is very important that we don't leave anyone behind because there will be a backlash. There will be gilets jaunes if the policy will be designed in a way that will only benefit the few, not the many. So that is the crucial and that, that, that's why we, we are, I mean, nowadays, and it also, I think, very briefly goes back to the first question we talked about, about the political landscape. Nowadays, the climate and the energy is something that everybody talks about. Conservatives talk about it, liberals are talking about it, even far right is talking about it, far left. Uh, but the different is, difference is that, I mean, we as the Greens, to challenge the right, uh, we can say that we, well, first of all, we really do deliver the, the green uh, transition, but also we deliver in a way that we don't leave anyone behind. But to challenge the far left, we take into consideration some uh, social aspects of it, but we really deliver the change. And we are seeing, I mean, green signing government in many countries, and we are seeing how it is possible. The green transition is possible. We just need political will and, well, the greens in power for that. Yesterday you held a very interesting workshop about uh, the difficulties one can face when establishing and communicating the idea of energy communities. In your experience, what was the biggest difficulty you had to overcome in order to first establish Hyperion, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. and then Electra? Electra and Hyperion are different entities. Electra is a social enterprise. It's working uh, for many years now. Hyperion is an energy community, which has uh, 35 members at the moment, and we will grow up to 140 uh, by the end of this year. So Hyper Hyperion faced a lot of barriers <laughs> starting. We were one of the first communities registered. And it was a brand new framework. No one know, knew how to register one, uh, one energy community. And it was frustrating at, at the start. But I think one of the main barriers was the grid space. The low voltage system network is actually full in many uh, regions in Greece, uh, which creates a huge um, problem for energy communities which want to just build a small solar park or a small infrastructure because there is no available space. It can be solved by upgrading the system. It can also be solved by, I don't know, going for even bigger projects so you can move out of the low voltage network. But I think this was the most difficult part for us. Other than that, we've heard lots of people struggling with finding the finances uh, to start the community. We've heard about 
the, the service is not working very well. Like you go to a public service and they tell you, oh, no, this is not our responsibility, but it is. <laughs> so we do not even have trained employees to, to empower and enable these kinds of projects. But I think it's maturing uh, nowadays and it's going to be even easier in the future. We already see lots of differences from like four years ago and now, and it's improving. So I'm only optimistic. You've been listening to part two of the future of Eastern Europe and eco-democracy, a four-part podcast special made possible by the Green European Foundation and the Green Institute of Greece.